Hey everybody this evening, so if we'd find our way on in and find us a chair and grab you up a hymn book, I almost feel like a visitor when you hang out for your family having COVID and you stay home like I told you. That's a weird feeling when you're supposed to be at church and you're at home and ain't nothing wrong with you. <laughs> That's a weird thing. It's one thing to be traveling or off, or, but when you're at home, that's, a, that's weird. But I'm glad to be back. I know we had a good day Sunday, even though I missed it, but I heard a lot of compliments on it, a good day. I'm sure everybody was blessed by that. But it's good to see everybody. Brother Byron, if you would open us up in a word of prayer, and then we'll sing us a song about some soldiers. Number 383, number 383, can you remain seated while we sing, a soldier in the army of the King of Kings, a soldier in the army of the King of Kings am I, he called me to his colors and for him I'll live or die, I'll go wherever he leads me and I'll do his least command, beneath the banner of the cross I gladly take my stand. I'm a soldier in the army, and the call to battle loudly rings. I'm a soldier in the army in of the King of Kings. The battle fierce is raging over land and over sea. of Calvary. The fight for souls must not be lost. I cannot falter, no. But in the strength of Christ, my Lord, I'll only forward go. I'm a soldier in the army, and the call to battle loudly rings. I'm a soldier in the army, in the army of the King. share the full reward of waiting some. Well, I have battle scars to show in heaven when we meet. How many crowns and trophies will I cast at Jesus' feet? I'm a soldier in the army, and the call to battle loudly rings. I'm a soldier in the You'll flip back to number 347. Number 347, when the battle's over. With another song about a soldier and the cross being the day of the Veterans Day. 347. Am I a soldier?
chapter 1, when you get ready to leave tonight, there's a couple of umbrellas in the office in there, some, you'd like to borrow some of them, that way maybe you won't get soaking wet a second time. Some of you came in, you look pretty, pretty wet. I had a little umbrella that covered everything except one arm and this arm got wet. How are y'all tonight? Good. All right, good to see you. Good to be here. Before I start preaching tonight, uh, I got a, a sweet note from Mrs. Upton thanking me for letting her be here. And that's, that's not the way it was supposed to be. I'm thanking her for being here. And uh, she thanked us for the love offering that we gave her. And, and so you, we gave her a check for $300. And she let me know that she had signed it and she's mailing it back. She wants us to put it in the officer's room. She said she was glad to hear her church supporting the blue. And she wanted to be a part of that. So she's sending the check back to go toward the officer's, supporting the officer's room. And that was very sweet of her. It was good to have her and mom together. They, they had a fun time talking. Uh, before they left Sunday afternoon, uh, that's Miss Upton and Chris. Miss Upton and Krista came together from Shelby. Uh, I heard Miss Upton tell my mom, "I'm going to come see you," and my mom said, "I'll look forward to it." So and they'll get together. They'll have a good time. Acts chapter number one. Of course, last time we started this book, introduced this book, and told you the theme verse was verse eight, and basically the. Not only the theme verse, but the theme of this book, of course, is the how, where, and why of spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. This book is about anointed Christians testifying salvation. And by the way, that purpose has not changed. The reason being, the book of Acts didn't have a good ending. I mean, it just abruptly was cut off. That meant everything's still going on. And we as anointed Christians today should still be testifying of salvation that God's given us. Now last time we started in verse number 1 and looked at the explanation for writing in verse 1 and 2. And of course we went back to Luke chapter 1 and saw there his uh, brief review in verse 1 and 2 of what he had already written. We saw the recorder of course was Luke even though, even though nowhere in the book of Luke and nowhere in the book of Acts does it tell us the name of the writer. Uh, church history tells us who wrote the book. And then we saw the recipient was a Theophilus. And of course, the name means lover of God or beloved by God. We don't know anything about this man other than his name. We, we know that 
Luke, and in the book of Luke, called him beloved and addressed him with the term most excellent, which again is a term uh, usually reserved for nobility or governmental officials. But other than that, we don't know anything about him. The second thing we saw last time, that there, through the book of Acts, there's an emphasis on the resurrection. Um, over and over and over, you find the resurrection emphasized. And of course, apart from the resurrection, you don't have a gospel to preach. So it would stand to reason that the resurrection is emphasized. And of course, we pointed out Sunday morning that repentance is also emphasized in the book. And of course, preaching is emphasized in this book. But there's an emphasis upon the resurrection. And then last time, we sort of introduced this third point, and this is where we're going to jump in tonight, back in verse number four, the expectation of the promise. And uh, I really don't know how long I'll be on this point. Uh, if I get through tonight, I think it would be a miracle. But nonetheless, let's jump in at verse number four. It says, And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, uh, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. The expectation of the promise. The first thing I want you to see is what I call the patience needed. He says here in the verse number where he says that they should not depart. That's the first uh, statement about waiting, paiting, uh, but having patience. Then he says, but, contrast, wait. And by the way, that word wait is a present tense. They were to continue to wait. Wait until what? Until the promise comes. Now we, we read last time Luke 24 and 49, and there it told them to tarry in Jerusalem until they were endued or clothed with power from on high. And the word tarry there... <laughs> It means to remain, means to stay put, to reside. So it's sort of interesting. Uh, two different ways in verse number 4, and then one time back in verse 49 in Luke, the emphasis upon them waiting. Now everyone in here just loves to wait. I would say that every single one of us in this room, that is the hardest thing for us all to do, is wait. Wait, especially waiting on something we are expecting. Now, if you're not expecting it, waiting is not a problem. Right? But if you're expecting something, it's hard to sit and just, quote, do nothing, right? Twiddle your thumbs. If you have the ability to busy yourself until whatever it is you're expecting comes along, you're a rare individual. Because most people don't. That's something we have to learn. Tribulations worketh patience. In other words, things not going the way you want is what allows you to develop or allow God to develop. Or another way that you can have patience is simply trust God and just put everything in His hand and, and then you just don't worry about it. And if you believe God, you shall not make haste. Again, Isaiah 28, 16 will tell you that. You shall not become impatient if you trust Him, if you believe Him. So there's more than one way to have patience. However, most of the time, most of us go through the tribulation route. Don't we? Okay, I just wonder, y'all looking at me a little strange there, but we see the patience that is needed. Now, I said a, a statement last week. I want to make that statement again tonight, and I may make it at the end of every one of my sub-points here, and, and this is a statement. The work of the church cannot be done apart from the presence of the Holy Spirit, okay? And here we see the patience needed. The second thing we see in this expectation of the promise is the promise of the Father. What is the promise of the Father? Now he goes on to say here, wait for the promise of the Father, which saith it, ye have heard of me. In other words, Christ Jesus had talked about this. Now, the first reference, go back with me to Luke chapter 24. Luke 24, and then we're going to jump in uh, to a number of places in the book of John. But Luke chapter 24, we see Christ Jesus mentioned in here as well. Luke 24, 49 says, And behold, I send the promise of my Father. 
Now notice, Christ says, I send the promise of my Father upon you. So he makes mention of the promise of the Father. Now, if we understood, and you can go to John chapter 4, the promise of the Father, and I pointed this out last week, and I'll restate it here. In chapter 2 of Acts, in verse number 16, Peter, when he steps up to preach, says, what you are seeing right now is Joel's prophecy coming true. And we'll look at Joel chapter 2 again here in just a minute. But in John chapter number 4 and verse number 14, Christ, of course, speaking, he says, But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Now, that verse, of course, is making a reference to the indwelling of the Spirit of God. You How you know that? Chapter 7 of the book of John. Chapter 7 of the book of John. And notice verse number 37. It says, In the last day, that, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the Scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Verse 39, But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. Notice also chapter 14 of the book of John. 14. Notice verse number 16. 14, 16. He says, I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Now here, of course, Christ is speaking of the Spirit of God, again, the comforter, and he connects it with the Father giving. Okay, notice also verse number 26. But the comfort which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name. He shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Notice chapter 15 and verse number 26. But when the comforters come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father... He shall testify of me. And ye shall bear witness because ye have been with me from the beginning. Chapter 16, verse 12. I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. Howbeit when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. Now notice the connection here. The things that Jesus wanted to say to his disciples in verse number 12, they were not mature enough to receive it yet. But... When the Spirit of God comes, then they will be able to receive that which Jesus wanted to teach them earlier. Why? Because they have matured. Number two, because they now have the indwelling Spirit of God that can teach continually. Now, when Jesus was on earth, he, you know, he could teach his disciples in, while they were around him. Right? The Spirit of God can teach how often? All the time. I mean, I've gone, I've gone to bed many nights confused about a passage of Scripture. Wake up the next morning totally understanding the passage of Scripture. I've dreamed about the passage of Scripture. Either that or the Spirit of God taught me through the night. Now, do you believe He can do that? I believe the Holy Spirit can work in your spirit while you're asleep. But guess what? Same thing has happened in the daytime. Even while I'm doing something else. My mind's still rolling, and the Spirit of God is still working, teaching me Scripture, the principles of Scripture, showing me how to apply Scripture. It comes down to if we meditate at all on the Scripture... And by the way, just let me stop here just briefly and, and say meditation is a huge part of our lives, or should be. You say, what is that? Where we, where we submit our minds and hearts to Scripture and the Spirit of God. And just let Him stew it in, you know. 
Uh, one of the best types of meat that I like is crock pot meat. And the reason it cooks it real slow. Not only that, but I love a, I, I love a good bowl uh, of pinto beans. I don't know if anybody down here likes pintos like I do, but, but it's got to be cooked slow. You know, low for hours. By the way, soup is the same way. Anything that cooks for hours, letting all those seasonings get worked down into whatever you're going to eat, it's better. And that's what our hearts have got to be to the Spirit of God. We've got to let Him slowly work the process of understanding Scripture. But that will never take place by accident. There's got to be an obvious choice on our part to yield ourselves to the Spirit of God in that way for Him to teach us. And it tells us that He will teach us. Let's come back to verse number 13. Howbeit when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. All things, notice this now, that the Father hath are mine. Therefore said I that he shall take of mine and shall show it unto you. Now, I don't know if you notice all the times in which Christ connected the verses concerning the Comforter and the Spirit of Truth to the Father. Come back, please, to Luke, I mean, excuse me, to Acts. And notice again chapter 2 and verse number 16. Chapter 2 and verse number 16. We'll back up and let's read verse 15 too. For these are not drunken as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day, but this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Now I'm going to stop right there. Go. Well, you don't have to. I'll turn to Joel chapter number 2. And I'm going to pick up reading in verse number 28. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions, and also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. And I will show wonders in heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and the terrible day of the Lord Come, and it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be delivered. By the way, that verse is quoted in Romans. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, shall be delivered. A quote out of this passage. And when was that? It was for the last days. And we, according to Scripture, have been in the last days since Jesus came. And here now, Peter is connecting that Joel passage was what was taking place on that day of Pentecost. May I submit to you this afternoon or this evening that the promise of the Father is the beginning and the ultimate fulfillment of the prophecy in Joel chapter 2 beginning in verse 28. It is with the Spirit of God being poured out upon all flesh. Now it started, of course, with His disciples. We pointed that out in John chapter 20 where Christ breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. In the Acts chapter 2 passage is where an empowerment is taking place for the church and a testimony of God's glory for the church. And we'll get to that a little bit more, but I want to throw that out to you now. A testimony of God's glory in the church. Old Testament. There was a testimony of God's glory filling the temple, the tabernacle first, then Solomon's temple. Each time it was a testimony to God's glory, that this is where I'm working. The church on this day is a testimony to the Jew of God's glory. There will be, a, there will be another one in the millennium when the millennial temple is dedicated. God's glory will fill that temple. And here in Acts chapter number 2, you have that as aspect of the day of Pentecost working as well. Not just the empowering of the church, but a, 
and public open testimony to the Jews that were there of God's glory in the church. May I state again, the work of the church cannot be performed without the Holy Spirit's presence. Now, I'll dive into uh, this a little bit more here in just a second. Go back to Acts chapter number 1. And let's notice the next thing. So we see the patience needed. We see the promise of the Father. And now notice verse number 5, the purpose explained. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days thence. The purpose explained. The purpose for the, bapt- for the baptism of the Spirit, or with the Spirit. Let me make sure I want to say that correctly. See, the purpose, we, had, we should stop and ask this question. What was the purpose of water baptism? I've heard, I don't know how many preachers make this statement. Every time they say it, I just cringe because it's not true. They say it's the first step of obedience. Baptism is not the first step of obedience. If that's true, then you can't be obedient in anything until you're baptized. Now, that's not what water baptism is. Now, water baptism is to show that, number one, one has been saved. And that would include repentance, confession, and faith. Or you're not saved. Can I say that again? It includes repentance, confession, and belief. If your salvation didn't include those three things, you're not saved. All right? But baptism is to show that you've been saved. And at the same time, it is to show that you're willing to identify with Christ through the local church. Through his body, the local church. It's not just, well, I'm going to identify with Christ. How do you identify with Christ? Through the local church. That is the agent of, of the, the baptism. You did, and I hear preachers talk, well, I baptized him in the hospital. No, you don't. I baptized him down. Now, you don't do any of that unless it's a church-sanctioned baptism. I hear people all the time talking about baptizing somebody and they're not even the pastor. Now, one of these days I'll preach a more thorough message on baptism, but there's got to be that willing to identify with the Lord's body, the local church. Now, if you were baptized not having done that, your baptism is totally illegitimate. Now, let's let that soak in. It would be what the old-time Baptists would call an alien baptism. It, it, it was worthless because you didn't identify with the Lord's body, the local church. Now, that also means that you were willing to walk in newness of life. That's Romans chapter 6, verse number 4. If a person gets baptized and he hasn't decided, I'm willing to walk in newness of life... He also was baptized illegitimately. That decision, I'm going to walk in newness of life, must be a part of your willingness to get baptized. And by the way, that's the reason why it's so dangerous to to push somebody to get baptized as soon as they get saved because they don't know what baptism means yet. And by the way, the the old-time Baptists... They almost never baptized anybody until there was a year in between their salvation experience and them proving fruits of repentance. That is what John the Baptist said to the people that came to him, want to be baptized. He said, you've got to bring forth fruits of repentance. You've got to show me that you've had a change in your life. And to baptize somebody that's not shown a change of life is to give them an assurance that they shouldn't have. Come back to this verse number 5. It says, for. And that little word for shows an explanation or gives a reason. It, It can be translated and often is because. Now let's go back and pull in the last part of verse number 4 and run into this again. Wait for the promise of the Father which saith that ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days since. Now, 
Let me point out here, as we look at this, there's a comparison here. When, when John baptized, he baptized you, as it says here, it says, with water. Literally, in water. Right? When you were baptized, the water didn't do anything. I mean, it, 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 didn't, it didn't help put you under. It, it didn't help bring you back up. It exercised no efforts, my point. Right? It was the medium in which John baptized. Well, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Notice it says, you shall be baptized with or in the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is not going to be doing anything either. It's going to be the medium in which these believers were baptized. Now, I'm trying to emphasize this because of a false teaching that's out there. You say, what false teaching? The false teaching at 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse number 13 is that it is the Holy Spirit that baptizes you. Now, you say, Pastor Kemp, don't confuse me. I'm trying to clarify it, not confuse you. Until the Reformation, there was two views of church. The Catholics said that they believed in a visible, universal church. Bible believers, mainly Baptists, said they believed in a visible, local church. And until the Reformation took place when so many men left the Catholics, or if you study history... They didn't leave the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church kicked them out. Those men didn't withdraw from the Catholic Church. They were trying their best to reform it. And therefore, the name Reformers. They, they weren't going to leave the church, the Catholics movement. But the Catholics booted them, excommunicated them. All of a sudden now, here's a group of men that still believe that their salvation was in the church. And the Reformation men came up with a new teaching. They now said, we believe in an invisible universal church. That teaching wasn't until then. And it didn't creep into the Baptist circles... And I said this a number of weeks ago. It didn't creep into the Baptist circles until many, many, many men were educated at non-denominational schools. What that simply means is we're Protestant. Now listen, there is a difference between being Protestant and being Baptist. Baptists are not Protestants. Because there was Baptists before... the. The, the Protestant Reformation. See, at the very beginning, there was one church. The church that Jesus Christ started. And as it went through the book of Acts, you'll find that later on in church history, there was a split. Why? Because some people, some of the churches started teaching things that are not biblical. What happened? People that held to the Bible separated from the group that started teaching wrong. So now you have two lines. Not just one church anymore. Now you have two lines. And this line over here that started teaching wrong became known as the Catholics. This branch over here were the Baptist, Bible-believing people. All right. All right, from this branch over here, then all of a sudden you have another split called the Protestants. This group over here stayed Bible believers. And of course you have continued splits off over here, multiple of the Protestant. Of course you have the Presbyterians, you have the Anglicans, you, you have the Lutherans, you have the Wesleyans, you have the Nazarenes, all, all on this branch over here. This branch over here is Bible believers. The Bible believers would not have anything to do with this branch over here. 
Why? Because they believe in separation. Are y'all with me? And this, this branch over here, the Catholics and Protestants and all that come from that, have propagated an invisible, universal church the whole time. This group over here says the church is seen in the local assembly. And then they rejected the teaching that they used with 1 Corinthians 12, 13. And we'll get to that here in a little bit. But I want to I point out some differences. You don't have to turn. I'm going to read these to you. It says, in verse 5, it says, For John truly baptized. Matthew chapter 3, verse number 11 says this, I indeed, John speaking, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I. That's a reference to the Lord Jesus Christ. Whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. I'll make a reference to the fire here in a second. Mark 1.8, I indeed have baptized you with water, but he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. Again, John the Baptist speaking, making a reference to Jesus going to be the one that does the baptizing. Luke 3, verse 16, John answered, saying unto them all, I indeed baptize with you with water, but one mightier than I cometh, the latchet whose shoes I am not worthy to unloose, he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. That Luke 3 passage, if you go on and study that, you'll see that fire is connected with judgment. Because he's going to sweep up the, the barn floor and they're going to burn up the chaff. Because fire is connected with the So Jesus Christ is going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire for all those that doesn't receive the Holy Ghost. It's going to be judgment. John 1, says, And I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remain on him, the same is he which baptizes with the Holy Ghost. We've seen four references, each one of them in the Gospels, pointed out by John the Baptist that Jesus Christ is coming and Jesus Christ will be the one that baptizes. Can we... Can we agree on that based on what we've read? We have to. Acts chapter 1 and verse number 5, it says, But ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Now who is speaking? Jesus Christ is speaking. Notice chapter 11 of Acts. Chapter 11 and notice verse number 16. Peter, of course, is speaking here. He's talking about his Cornelius experience. And he is explaining now to Jewish believers what took place. Peter says, Then remembered I the word of the Lord, how that he said, John indeed baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. Now what does Peter do here? He connects... Cornelius and the people around him receiving the Holy Spirit with exactly what took place to him and the rest of the disciples in chapter 2. Now go with me to 1 Corinthians. So what I'm trying to say, there's four references in the gospel, all by John the Baptist, that said that Jesus would be the baptizer. Now we have two statements in Acts in an indirect way John is involved because John is mentioned, but both of these, Peter refers to the Lord Jesus Christ. In, Acts, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, notice verse number 12. For as the body is one, and hath many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. The universal, invisible church people says that the Spirit of God, that the Spirit of God baptizes you into that invisible body, church, the moment you're saved. That's what they teach, this verse says. 
That is a Protestant view of the local church and, and the universal church. Baptist, for their existence, has rejected a universal church position. And they say that this verse right here refers to how the Spirit of God will work in your heart to unify you into a local church. That, by the way, is the position of Baptist churches for centuries on this verse right here. By the way, that is the position that this man right here takes. That it's the Spirit of God will work in people's so Who brings you and why do you join a local church? It's the Spirit of God working and bringing and unifying you into one body. And by the way, the, there's all kinds of teachings out there about the church. The church and the body of Christ are synonymous. In 1 Corinthians, notice verse number 27, chapter 12. Now ye are the body of Christ. Now who's he talking to? He's talking to the church of God at Corinth. We could go back to the first chapter. It's written to the church of God at Corinth. And he tells the church of God at Corinth, ye are the body of Christ. Guess what? He would have said the same thing to the church at Ephesus. He would have said the same thing to the church at Philippi. He would have said the same thing to the church at Colossae. And he says the same thing about the church at Victory Baptist Church. Ye are the body of Christ. He said, now how can that be, being that there's churches everywhere? Every local church is the body of Christ in that area. The best illustration that I can give to sort of help, help your mind wrap around that thought, you go to McDonald's, where you go? You go to McDonald's, right? Whichever McDonald's you're in, you're in McDonald's. And in whichever local church you're in, if it truly is a church, it's the body of Christ is what my point is. Okay? Now, from the verses I've read, again, the Roman Catholics hold to a universal, visible church with the Pope as the head. There is another movement out there, the charismatic movement, believes that the spirit baptism is an experience to be sought after. And they teach that the proof of receiving the Spirit, and that means, is speaking in tongues. What is really strange is this, the charismatic movement for years teaches people how to speak in the tongue, how to speak in tongues. If it's something that you receive as proof of receiving the Spirit of God, you shouldn't have to be taught how to do it. Nowhere in Acts chapter 2 is there anything they were taught how to do it. No, it's a supernatural event. Now, there's a third position, and that's what is called the Protestant, or let me label it another way, because this is where it infiltrated the Baptist movement, the fundamentalist tradition. I've gotten in trouble with a lot of people about what I'm getting ready to say. I'm not a fundamentalist. I'm an independent, fundamental Baptist. There's a difference between the two statements. See, in my mind, a, a man that says, I'm a fundamentalist, is a compromiser. You say, what are you talking about? Well, for years there was, used to be fundamentalist conferences. You go to a fundamentalist conference. By the way, I've been to one. You're going to find Baptists there, independent Baptists. You'll find Southern Baptists there. You'll find Presbyterian there. You'll find Wesleyan Methodists there. You'll find two or three different branches of Presbyterians. Uh, you'll find Nazarene. You'll find a whole bunch of, I mean, what, are, what am I saying? It's a big conglomeration of people coming together because they say they can agree on five fundamentals of the faith. My Bible doesn't tell me to agree on five fundamentals and come together in fellowship. It tells me if somebody holds another doctrine other than what this book teaches for me to mark them and to avoid them. There's no way that I can go to a, a seminar or a conference and sit down with a baby baptizer and call him brother. 
I will not do it. And once I saw what, what it was, I, ha- I never went back to another fundamentalist conference. I didn't realize there's going to be every strife of people believing everything there. Baby baptism is unbiblical. Thousands and thousands and yay, millions of Baptists down through hundreds of hundreds of recorded church history died over that one thing because they would not baptize babies. And not just the Catholics killed us. The Presbyterians killed us. The Lutherans killed us. And a few others killed us. Killed us Baptists because we would not submit to baby baptism. So how can I go to that conference now and put my arm around and call them brother? I can't. But see, they teach that that the believer is baptized by the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ at the instant of salvation. And the sad thing about it is most people, uh, with that statement, most people would say amen. They would say, I agree with that. Not realizing what you're agreeing to. See, this position is the position of those brethren that believe in the invisible, universal, mystical body of Christ church theory. I don't believe in that. See, the historic Baptist position is the church, which is the body of Christ, which verse 27 we read, is fulfilled only in a local assembly. Only in a local assembly. See, this church, the historic Baptist position of the church, the body of Christ, that this church is solely made up of born again and scripturally baptized, that is, by immersion people. See, we're very strong on if your baptism is not by immersion, you're, you're not baptized biblically. And by the way, we Baptists have been killed for that down through the centuries too. They would call us rebaptizers. That's where we got our name because the Catholic Church called us rebaptizers and it shortened to Baptists after a while. See, a Baptist wouldn't say, no, we didn't rebaptize anybody because there wasn't a first baptism. Sprinkling is not a baptism, so there wasn't one. So we did it the first time. I've been baptized five times. One time as a lost 12-year-old boy. Three times forward as a brethren. And then when I started studying Scripture, I saw that those previous four was worthless. I mean, you could lost, your baptism's worth it. If if you're baptized three times forward, it's unbiblical. And when I saw that it's the type of the death, burial, resurrection, I realized that I'd not been baptized properly, so I went to my now independent Baptist pastor and asked him to baptize me. So the fifth time really was my first time. See, the church was began by Christ Jesus during His earthly ministry. We've talked about that before. And that church that was started by Christ in His earthly ministry will continue until the rapture. Now, this church is autonomous. And as such, is free from any and all external authority of control. An autonomous church means that church as it's led by the Spirit of God, will make a decision that they believe will please God. Now, go back to Acts chapter 11. Now, the sixth reference that we read in Acts, we saw that from that statement that you have to go back again in chapter number 10, Because chapter 11 doesn't make any sense unless you know what took place in chapter 10. So chapter 10 is connected. And and I'm not going to get into chapter 10 tonight because I will do that when we get there. But chapter 10, of course, is again where Cornelius, a Gentile, received the Spirit of God. And that's one thing that Peter points out. He said... Notice verse number 17 of chapter 11. For as much then as God gave them, the Gentile, the like gift as he did unto us, the Jew, 
who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, what was I that I could withstand God? See, the Jew, the typical Jew, did not believe that the Gentile could get saved and therefore could receive the Spirit of God. God had to prove to the Jew that he meant salvation for everybody, not just the Jew. So here we see that the Gentile received the Spirit of God just like the Jew did. Now, Paul teaches that there's one baptism. That's Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number 5. And I'll read that verse. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number 5 says this. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. Now we've seen six references tonight that point to the baptizer as Jesus Christ. Paul says there's one baptism. The Protestant crowd said, no, 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 the Holy Spirit baptizes. Now I, I, I ask this question, who is right? The Bible and Paul that says there's one and that the Bible says that six times Jesus Christ is going to be to the baptizer. Or is the Protestants right when they said the Holy Spirit baptizes somebody? I submit to you that the Protestants are not correct. I submit to you that the Scripture is correct. We could also dive into Romans chapter 5, or excuse me, 6, that talks about baptism. We could go to Galatians chapter 3 that talks about baptism. We could go to Colossians chapter 2 that talks about baptism. Paul in those three places talk about baptism. And 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we have already read, is another reference to baptism in Ephesians chapter 4. So five times Paul talks about baptism. I submit to you that all five of them, when hermeneutically studied, will show that each one of the five is talking about water baptism. Not spirit baptism as the Protestants teach. By the way, you go to Romans chapter 6, pick up a Roman commentary, and they'll teach spirit baptism. You go to Galatians chapter 3, pick up a Protestant commentary, and they'll, speak, they will teach spirit baptism. Hermeneutically, in its proper place, every one of those references teaches water baptism. Okay? Now... A lot of good men will differ over what I'm teaching tonight. They will hold to the Protestant view if they want to. I don't, and I won't, and I won't teach it. Because I'll tell you what they say, and I'll tell you what the Scripture says, and then you're going to have to make your mind up. Are you going to follow and believe what the Bible says? Or are you going to believe what a man will tell you that it says, or what it clearly says? My ultimate conclusion, I'll stop here tonight. We'll pick up here next time. I have a whole lot more to say. But uh, my final argument to the, you is this. We've seen six references. All of those referred to Jesus Christ doing the baptism. Protestants say 1 Corinthians teaches that the Spirit will. But Paul says there's one baptism. Are there two? Was he confused? Was he wrong? I think not. And we'll dive into more of that next week. Lord, we thank you again for your word and ask you to bless us as we study it. In Jesus' name, amen. We've got a lot of prayer requests, a lot of things to pray for. First, tomorrow.